I have uh, uh, a great privilege to uh, introduce our today's uh, presenter, uh, Deacon Dr. Haik Utijan, who is uh, a performer, is an orchestral conductor, chorus master, is a musicologist. He serves as a senior deacon in the Armenian church. He's also a researcher with interest in the musicology and theology of the Armenian hymnal and the works of St. Gregory of Narek. Dr. Utijan was decorated with Komitas Medal by the Armenian state and the Hakob Megapart Medal by the National Library of Armenia. And I invite you to go to our website to read uh, his biography in uh, more details. And Haik Sarkavak, Khantrem, Zer Um Ambok Chushadrutsuna, Zedne. Thank you very much, dear uh, father. If you would kindly allow me to share my screen, I should like to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, your Grace, very reverend fathers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a tremendous honor as well as a very great pleasure for me to be able to speak to you and to sing a little even uh, this evening uh, on a subject that is truly very dear to my heart, namely the celestial melodies of the Armenian Divine Liturgy. And I shall have the opportunity of explaining to you why I have chosen that particular description, celestial melodies. Let us start with a very brief demonstration. That was the Lord Prayer in a version uh, arranged by Archimandrite Komitas that is not very usually performed. I believe that he may have first performed it at a concert of his in Paris. But this is of some significance to me, not least because it was on the Sunday of the elevation of the Holy Cross in Prague. And I had the great pleasure of having trained a small class of interested 
amateur singers, mostly Czechs, who took part in uh, the summer seminar organized each year by the uh, Czech Association for Sacred Music, uh, which that year chose to include a course on Armenian sacred music. And uh, the entire uh, divine liturgy was sung by this group in Komitas's version, uh, whilst in the afternoon we reconvened in another church which has a courtyard so that we performed the Vespers and I dare say we did everything properly. It took three hours or perhaps just under three hours. Um, so this is one of my uh, uh, very happy uh, memories. Um, although in my talk I shall try to bring to bear my experience as an orchestral and choral conductor and a musicologist and the even more important fact of my being a deacon. Uh, nonetheless, this started from my childhood. I was taken to services at an early age by my parents. I was never forced to do so, but I was given to understand that it was my choice, but that I might regret missing their services. And, of course, once one experiences a certain taste, a certain one gains a flavour uh, for the melodies of the Divine Liturgy, and not just the melodies, but the sacrament itself. Um, once one experiences that, albeit in a very small way, um, it is apt to linger in one's mind and one seeks it out uh, for the rest of one's life. As a child, I first listened, then I started singing myself. Um, as a child, I know that I found two tape recorders and on my own, using my voice, I tried to record some of my favorite bits from the Comitas liturgy by recording myself over and over again. The church where I had my most important early experiences as a child, attending services, uh, that is the offices as well as the Divine Liturgy, was the Greek Orthodox Church at Ayos Domedios in Nicosia, which had been very generously made available to the Armenian community, which some years prior to my birth had lost its own church in central Nicosia in the old town, the Armenian quarter having been cleansed ethnically during the troubles of 1963. I had a number of very positive experiences subsequently. Um, I was greatly honored the year when I was invited to Armenia to conduct the Armenian Philharmonic Orchestra, 2003 if I remember rightly. Uh, an even greater honor and a far greater pleasure uh, to me was being invited to conduct the choir of the uh, Cathedral of St. Sarkis. And having conducted the Yekmalyan Badarak for a couple of weeks, their uh, chorus mistress very graciously said that they had not in fact performed the Gomidasyan Badarak, and if I were willing, um, the singers were more than willing to attend daily rehearsals so that they would learn it. And so during the rest of my stay in Armenia, we performed the Gomidasyan Badarak during services, which was a most soul enhancing uh, experience uh, for me. And the singers were excellent, very, very receptive and very, very gracious. I have already referred to the summer course for the Czech Sacred Musical Society that culminated in the Chachverats services. Uh, that was a very great pleasure indeed. And uh, subsequently, uh, when due to family circumstances, I spent a good deal of time in Copenhagen, I was called upon to teach a Danish youth choir, the Egmalian Liturgy which I did, and we had a service together at which I tried to perform the deacon's duties as well as accompany at the organ, as well as nod with my head and try to keep the singers together, who subsequently, I believe, went to Armenia and they sang the Yekmalyan Badarak there to the satisfaction of the faithful who were present. And my 
very brief account of particularly uh, formative moments would have been gravely incomplete uh, were I not to mention uh, the very particular and precious to me combination of devoutness and musicality that I experienced at the last bastion of Constantinople in present-day Istanbul, though the Armenian community is but a shadow of what it used to be, nonetheless there is much of great value there in terms of solemn services, uh, not only offices, daily offices, uh, but also the Divine Liturgy. And I have to say that I was most impressed by the wonderful Gomidas interpretation, particularly at the Church of the Holy King in Kadıköy, which is on the Asian side of uh, Istanbul. A church, incidentally, where uh, the very great Constantinopolitan musicologist Thierry Adendesian uh, served as director of music. Now, let us start and see who may have composed some of the hymns that we take so much delight in singing and hearing when we attend the Badarak, the Divine Liturgy of the Holy Armenian Apostolic Orthodox Church. Well, to start not perhaps chronologically, but um, if we look at the very beginning of the Divine Liturgy, one of the best loved hymns is the hymn of Vestment, Chorurt Chorin, O Mystery Deep, that, according to historians, is attributed to Khachadur of Daron, who is known as having served as abbot of the monastery of Hagartzin that you can see in, on this slide. And historians describe a field mass, an open air mass, that was held somewhere in Lori at around 1203 or 1204 or thereabouts, at which Khachadur just stood up and for the first ever time sang Chorurt Chorin Anhas Anaskispen. The attribution to him is reliable, not least because if we look at the first letter of each stanza, uh, there is an acrostic and we get the name Chachadur formed. But we can go slightly further back chronologically and rather reliably uh, because there are numerous sources that agree about this not only historians, but also manuscripts of a liturgical nature, attributing many of the uh, chants in the Armenian Divine Liturgy to Saint Nerses the Gracious, whom you can see here depicted in a most marvelous, tiny uh, breviary that is kept at the Mechitarist convent in Vienna. And Giragos Kanzagetsi, as well as others, refer to the fact that the saint enriched the Divine Liturgy with sweet melodies and in a mystical manner. Sweetness and the mystical character seems to be emphasized in most descriptions. One writer mentions the fact that with those chants, the saint aimed to soften the hearts of the listeners and to permit them to proceed from the realm of their senses uh, this beautiful music, uh, particularly, uh, to transcend those senses and to proceed to the mystery that is intelligible, but not otherwise open to being detected with our bodily uh, senses. Uh, there are various slightly different uh, accounts as to the extent to which Saint Nerses the Gracious may have contributed some of those chants. My own late teacher, Zareh Serpazan of Blessed Memory, has contributed to the literature, as did uh, Father Revont Alishan and others. Uh, the thing is that there are some sources which ascribe rather more to Saint Nerses and others a little bit less. But it seems very likely that the hymns that we sing just before Holy Communion and afterwards were composed by him. Uh, the hymns that we sing during the Epiclesis, uh, when there is a prayer addressed to the Holy Spirit in which the celebrant uh, presents the gifts of the bread and wine and seeks 
that they be, as the Armenian text has it, transposed, as opposed to the Latin term transubstantiated, which has a slightly different uh, sense, perhaps. Um, and uh, Revont Alishan, for example, uh, was convinced also that St. Nerses the Gracious composed Christos Image Mer Heidnitzav also. One very interesting way of trying to put these things to the test and see what we can learn is having recourse to the earliest sources at our disposal, namely medieval manuscripts of different genres. Uh, the earliest source that I have been able to uh, see is a Daharana book of odes uh, kept at the Paris Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, copied in the monastery of Trazarg uh, in the year 1241. Rather unusually, although it is a Dagaran, it also includes some of the chants of the Divine Liturgy, as well as some of the uh, deacons' uh, litanies. And here you can see Madik Arder Yevarekas Louis, which we sing during Holy Communion, Diaren Nersisi Hayots Katorigosi Asatsial. Another source is a different type of manuscript, Manrus Monk, literally minute studies, again copied in Drazarg uh, some decades later. This particular manuscript is kept in San Lazaro uh, and is under the care of the Mkhitaryist fathers in Venice. Now, Manrus Munk manuscripts tend to include some of the chants in the offices, highly melismatic, complex, slow melodies. Sometimes you find that a whole page is filled with neumes over only two or three syllables. Um, and from the Divine Liturgy, they usually have introits, jamamuds, and hagaiades, uh, to use a word coined by Diran Sarpazan of Blessed Memory, or hagiologies, as the Mechitarist fathers prefer to refer to them. We refer to them as Sarpasatsutyunk in the Armenian Church, which we sing during the Great Entrance. Um, it is very unusual, though, for Manrus Munk manuscripts to have more or less the entire divine liturgy, which this particular exemplar uh, does. Um, and you see again Christos Badarakyal, Madik, and so forth. But the pages are jumbled. There's a misplaced folio on the right hand side, as you see. So after uh, giving thanks, we are proceeding back to the Sanctus, which is clearly incorrect. The pages were bound uh, incorrectly in this source. And yet another source is a slightly different manuscript, which is a missal. It includes the, as they are often referred to, uh, secret prayers of the celebrant, as well as the things that the celebrant sings out aloud, and the chants of the clerks, and some of the litanies of the deacons. This manuscript is kept in Vienna. Uh, again, it's under the care of the Mkhitaryist fathers, and you can see Christos Badarakyal in the middle of the right-hand side folio, Madikarder Yevarekas Luis, Alleluia. Uh, here you can distinguish the neumes rather clearly, they are mostly red, whereas the verbal text, the verbal underlay, if you wish, is in black, for those of you who might not be familiar with Armenian script. Now, an interesting point is that after you see surp isurp advagan marno harene diaren meroyev perchin hisuse christosi, which is usually sung by the celebrant, one is accustomed to hearing derva ormia before the deacon chants salmos asatsek diarnas duzo merum, or as it is here, mero tebirk. But the derva ormia is not to be found in early manuscripts, and the reason is that it was the most recent addition to the Divine Liturgy. It is ascribed to Catholicos Simeon Yerevanzi. Um, he composed a very long poem that starts with Der Vormia, Der Vormia, Jesus Pergich, Mer Vormia, Mes Vormia, and so on, um, of which only a small portion is sung in the, in the Divine Liturgy. But for most of us, it would be inconceivable not to sing the Derba Ormia in the course of the Divine Liturgy. 
And yet it is a late addition, perhaps the most modern addition to the Armenian Divine Liturgy. As you can see, it is missing here. Now, I propose that we compare the numations of four chants that are common to all three of those sources. As you can see, we are gradually proceeding along the timeline. The Paris manuscript was copied in 1241, the Venice one in 1313, and the Vienna one in 1377. We cannot read the Armenian medieval news. We can, of course, do a bit of detective work, and I have spent a, quite a lot of time doing that, and God willing, I hope to do so for a, a, a while yet. But even if we do not seek to gain any particular meaning from those news, uh, what is rather striking is that ancient chants such as, such as the Sanctus, Surp, Surp, Der Zolutians, uh, and the Lord's Prayer, Heir Mervor Herginses, uh, we find that the numations in the three sources are substantially different in each source, as you can see. But in the case of those chants ascribed to Saint Nerses the Gracious, surprisingly, we find that the nunes are virtually identical in all three sources. You can see that uh, in the bottom half of this slide, Heir Yergnavor and Christos Badarakyan, I have only copied out some of the opening words, but it's essentially uh, uh, the same situation for the remainder of those chants. It appears that we have the same melody. Could it be that scribes and church musicians held those chants attributed to the saint in particular veneration so that even if melodies as they almost certainly did evolved over the centuries nonetheless they felt that they should adhere to the letter of what they were copying so to speak and they reproduced the neumes accurately and faithfully generation from generation to generation an interesting thought you can indeed see Hyriet Navor in the three sources has the same news across the board. Likewise with Christos, Badarakyal and Madik. Now in the case of Madik it has various stanzas and the oldest manuscript, the 1241 manuscript, has some stanzas which no other manuscript I've seen has in their entirety nor indeed Father Katerjan's uh, volume, Katerjan being our leading uh, scholar of the Armenian Divine Liturgy. Uh, so in order to allow like to be compared with like, so to speak, I have in the second column and in the third column have recourse to different portions of the Paris manuscript in order to uh, match the chants together and the numations are essentially the same in those sources. Now I mentioned that we are unable to read the medieval neumes, but fortunately we are in a better position as far as the more modern Armenian notation system is concerned, which is usually ascribed to Hampartsum Limongian, although there is evidence to suggest that Father Minas Pezheshkian, the uh, Venice Mechitarist father, also played a role and essentially this notation system borrowed some of the signs of the medieval neumes but gave them a completely new significance, redefined them radically so that the resulting system is no longer properly pneumatic. It is something analogous to the tonic solfa notation or the Greek so-called lesbian notation invented by Georgios Lesvios, uh, a notation the use of which was forbidden by the ecumenical patriarchate later on as they favored the chrysanthine notation. But it is interesting to note that it is at around the same time, namely the very beginning of the 19th century, and the same milieu, namely that of Constantinople, that both Armenians and Greeks sought to uh, renew, reform, 
or even redefine their system of sacred musical notation. We owe the fact that we have the melodies of our Badarak, of the Divine Liturgy, as well as those of the Armenian hymnal and of the breviary chants uh, transcribed in this reliable system of notation uh, in the 1870s primarily in Vahar Shabbat in present-day Echmiadzin by Catholicos Kevork II, a Constantinopolitan and a fine church musician himself. Uh, he instigated this work and he passed away before all of the volumes were published but it is very much his own work. But as he was not familiar with the system of notation, though he was well familiar with the melodies themselves, he made use of the services of another Constantinopolitan, Nigoros Tashtian, who was given the task of notating the melodies that were dictated to him. Um, and another person, also Constantinopolitan, who played a role in this was Garabed Baghdadlian, sometimes referred to as Garabed Terzagian. Until very recently, most of us thought that in fact Tashjan was in charge of the whole operation. But very recent research undertaken by my friend and colleague Dr. Aram Kerovpian has revealed that in fact Tashjan was very often frustrated in that he would write down and redact melodies only to find that after he had corrected the proofs some of those transcriptions would be changed. Uh, perhaps the Catholicos gave precedence to Garabed Bardadalian. Um, uh, it is not exactly clear what happened, but Tashjan found himself very soon in the ironic position of being very much identified with the Vahar Shabbat publications and finding himself having to defend those publications even if he may have had reservations about certain aspects and details himself. This is the recent volume by Aram Kerovpian, which uh, meticulously uh, documents much of what was going on behind those transcriptions. And indeed, there were some Constantin Constantinopolitan musicians who were never satisfied with those transcriptions, and in 1934 they uh, published other ones. But remaining for the time being with the Vahar Shabbat Missal of 1878, this is Chorurt Chorin, uh, attributed to Chachadur Daronatsi. The melody, of course, is unlikely to be what he sang, but the words at least are his. This is a later version published in Constantinople, referred to as the Ma'ar Yelanak, the main melody and it has some very unusual and beautiful melodies, including some ornate melodies of the diaconal chants. Um, uh, for instance, Mi Vok sounds something like Mi Vok with the Marmin de Runagan to match. There's a lovely version of Surp Surp.
And after this is sung thrice, we have do You see that here it approaches the Comitas version somewhat. Uh, some unusual and really rather unique melodies may be found in isolated collections. One uh, is a manuscript, a, a substantial tome, handwritten by my own late teacher, Vahan Bedelian. Uh, he has transcribed uh, or copied from somewhere uh, a brief excerpt from the Divine Liturgy, which he has described as Yaranag Sebastio, Melodies of Sebast. And let me try and indicate to you a little bit. This is Christos Imechmer Heitnetzav, which many likewise attribute uh, to Saint Nerses the Gracious. Christos Imechmer of Boren Ast Mads Ast Paz Mets of Hautun Sein Hönschets of Surbochtuni I meant Charutian, Sein Hanchetsav, of course. Now, uh, even with the Limongian notation system, there are some uncertainties. For example, the sign for F sharp here, which is a Vernachar, appears without a tilde, whereas here it has one. So probably this ought to have been sung at a lower pitch than this. This may have been a proper F sharp, this may have been slightly lower. And here we find that there's an F natural, in fact. You hear and so forth. Uh, this is a melody that I have not encountered elsewhere, uh, and who knows how much else there may have been in various provinces of historical Armenia that may have failed to reach us. Nonetheless, what we do have constitutes uh, untold wealth, and we are only scratching the surface of it uh, in our investigations. Now, I mentioned the great Armenian musicologist and church musician Yeriad and Desian. Um, we don't have any transcriptions of his of the Divine Liturgy, alas. We have only his hymnal. But there are articles in which he describes the succession of tonal centers and something about the modality, from which we realize that probably the modality was similar to what we sing today. He refers to something rather identical to the Tartsevatsk modulant or auxiliary versions of the Pensa, second uh, mode, uh, authentic, and Kimgen, third mode, plagal. Modes. Also, he describes that there was chaos. In proceeding from various sections, it seems that, as he says, Another oddity and a rather fascinating discovery on the part of my colleague, the eminent Byzantine uh, sacred musical specialist, Professor Alexander Lingas, which he generously shared with me, 
is a transcription in Byzantine neumes, in the Chrysanthine notation, of a through composed introit. We usually sing something like Christos Haria Vimer Elots Mafampas Makochiats. We sing it Karozi Ranagov, we sing it ekphonetically, the way we chant the gospel or we sing some of the litanies. But this melody is a uh, if I may so put it, proper melody. Christos which might match the processional hymn I saw her of so in fact this through composed introit may be a remnant of a much earlier tradition uh, attested by some medieval manuscripts such as this particular Venice Manrus Munk where as you can see Christos Haryavi Merelots is fairly richly numated suggesting that a melody was sung not just people chanting it quickly uh, in a sort of karozianag, ekphonetically. A tantalizing little fragment of very great value indeed for all sorts of reasons. Other unusual melodies we find amongst those transcribed by the brilliant Venetian Italian musician Pietro Bianchini, who was enamored of Armenian sacred music, which he first experienced on the island of San Lazaro. And uh, he transcribed melodies from 1855 onwards. Uh, much of what he transcribed was published rather later, but not everything. And I found some veritable jewels during my uh, research uh, trips to San Lazaro, where I'm most grateful to the Mechitarist fathers for their generosity in allowing me unfettered access. Uh, this particular manuscript uh, is in fact kept at the Library of Congress. Um, may I ask our listeners to mute their microphones, please? I can hear various, no various noises. Thank you so very much. Um, this is a transcription of the ode that is sung during the Divine Liturgy if the celebrant is a bishop or higher, or, or of higher rank, under Yal Tastuzno. And it's a melody that I have not found anywhere else. Allow me very briefly to sing a little of it, if I may. Uh...
you must excuse my attempt to sing sotto voce in consideration of the neighbours, uh, it being well past midnight here. But I do hope I was able to give you a fair idea of this rather unusual and rather beautiful uh, chant that would not have reached us had it not been transcribed by Bianchini. I'm most grateful for, to Dr. Levon Avdujan of the library, uh, uh, until recently of the library, for making a scan of this manuscript available to me. Um, given that we associate a pro-Western attitude, a progressive attitude, uh, with the highly educated Mechitarist fathers of the 19th century, and rightly so, after all, they were very much aware of, of their sense of mission of both introducing Armenian culture, art, spirituality to Europe and the West, as well as enriching the Armenian tradition with whatever was best from the European tradition. One would have been forgiven for assuming that Bianchini's transcriptions into Western staff notation and his harmonizations might have been adopted by the Mechitarist fathers in Venice without opposition. But in fact, it turns out that that is not quite the case. And a set of four precious newly discovered letters addressed by Bianchini to Father Raphael Turians, who was in Paris at the time, this correspondence dates from between 1855 and 1857, give a rather more interesting and nuanced picture. Again, I am very grateful to the Mechitarist fathers, particularly Father Vahan Ohanyan, and also to my dear friend and colleague, the musicologist Dr. Giuseppe Sanfratello, who assisted me with the translations. This is a specimen of what Bianchini uh, wrote. You can see his beautiful handwriting. And in, on, in all four of the preserved letters, he uses the word regolare, to regulate or perhaps to regularize. Uh, this word could have a rich variety of senses. It seems that Bianchini, first of all, wished to give a certain fixity to the melodies of the Divine Liturgy. These appear previously to have been rendered with considerable freedom, perhaps entailing a combination of memory, semi-improvisatory procedures themselves reliant on memory, and a certain very crude large-scale interpretation of the pneumatic notation. But Bianchini may also have intended a certain desire for order, for standardization. And there is no doubt that in seeking to transcribe those melodies into Western staff notation, he must have applied a certain degree of redaction to make this rather free-ranging music fit, so to speak. And regularization may also have entailed quite simply notating the melodies in such a manner that they would be subject to the regularity then still associated with bars or measures of regular length. Now, some monks greatly supported and encouraged him, and others appear to have opposed his uh, harmonization and his work. And it appears that experimentally, on one occasion, um, his, some of the hymns of the Divine Liturgy transcribed and arranged by him were performed, and some people loved it, others did not. And Bianchini, in one of the later letters, refers to the bitterness that I feel seeing the work I began with so much effort, the work which was to be the honor of the nation and the decorum of the Armenian rite, the work that was to be received and appreciated with holy enthusiasm, to fall all of a sudden for the reason that certain fathers want things to be absolutely in the same state as before. Bianchini in those letters makes a pragmatic appeal to the patriotic inclinations of the Mechitarist fathers. And he says that Europeans who until now have not taken much interest in Armenian chant, they will realize if only these divine praises are written and regulated, that 
Armenian chant is not a whit inferior to Gregorian chant, but perhaps in certain points even surpasses it. And he had very much a sense of mission. He writes, God wills it, good taste, good Armenian taste. civilization desire it. Oh, how future generations will be grateful to us and remember us singing the divine praises using those regulated notes. Another argument of his is theological, that music is the queen of science, which was born to harmonize the praises of the Most High, created by divine wisdom, because it wanted to be glorified by it. Uh, so that if God likes the purest offerings, so also music, being the most pleasing incense to him, will surely be more pleasing should we offer it perfected. The idea that harmonization constitutes perfection and that we owe to apply what is most perfect, the most fulfilled uh, results that the art, the state of the art of every age permits, uh, is one that we find being used by Magar Yegmalian rather later. But before Legmalian, let us briefly glance at Christophor Karamurza, who was born in the Crimea and died in Tiflis, and he is using a particular non-standard form of the Limonjan notation, which was successfully decoded by my uh, dear friend and senior colleague, the late Krikor Pidejian. This is a photograph of Garamurza with one of the choirs that he organized. He was a tireless, uh, what we might call, animateur these days. Um, and there is more than a single version of the Divine Liturgy, but only one has been preserved in its entirety. And that was discovered by Krikor Pidejian at the Charents Museum. Excerpts of another version were unearthed and published by another friend and fine musicologist, Haig Avakian, uh, and the premiere of one version of the Harmonized Divine Liturgy was given on Easter Day in 1886 in Baku, where we must not forget, in the light of current events, Baku was a great Armenian cultural center. Uh, you can see one of the several churches in central Baku uh, on the slide on the left-hand side. And uh, Karamurza... Uh, maintained friendships, either personal connections or correspondence, with Dikran Chuhajian, you can see depicted on the upper right-hand side corner, Pietro Bianchini, whom I have mentioned, and Mikhail Ippolito Vivanov, whose orchestral piece, number four of the four occasion sketches the procession of the Sardar, is a beautiful arrangement of a piece that is known by most Armenians as Zeytun Sineru Kailerk Arev Yelav Zeytun Siner, a much loved melody, which in the preface to the score, uh, Ippolito Vivanov acknowledges as being uh, a war song of the citizens of Zeytun. Now, in 1890, alas, Karamurza's harmonized version was suppressed by the bishop of the day, Bishop Mesrop Sampadia. The bishop wished to appear to be a fair man, so it is said that he invited Garamurza to have the same chants sung once with his choir, harmonized, and then once in unison. And his verdict was unequivocal. Unison is better. Enraged, Garamurza returned in the darkness holding his, in his hand a candelabrum with four candles, of which he had extinguished three, and light was coming out of only one candle. And when the bishop said, but it's dark, why is it that only one candle is being lit? Uh, Garamurza said, this is exactly what you have done with the music of the army and divine liturgy. Fortunately for Garamurza, he was promoted in that he was appointed as director of music to the Mother Sea of Holy Etchmiadzin, where he premiered his Harmonized Divine Liturgy in 1892 on the feast of Saints Thaddeus and Bartholomew, 
the founders of the Armenian Church, and in Echmiadzin also he performed Pamporodan, composed by Bianchini, his friend, and a setting of a lovely poem by none other than Father Revont Alishan of the Mkhitarist congregation in Venice. Now, one of the soloists in the choir in Holy Echmiadzin, which Karamurza conducted, was none other than a young deacon called Komidas Solomonian. And believe it or not, according to Krikor Pidejian's researches, Komidas, whom we now know to have been a very progressive uh, figure, at the time, as a young deacon, was conservative. And apparently Gomidas protested, saying that God is one, music too should be sung in a single voice. And Garamurza had to reprimand young Gomidas and say, why do you forget that God is the union of three persons? But some of the more conservative uh, brethren uh, of the uh, Echmiadzin Brotherhood were against his uh, harmonized versions, uh, there were arguments of the sort that the church is a holy place, not a theater. And may the composer go to his papist, Romea Tavan, Catholic comrades, and propagate it there. It turns out that, in fact, Garamurza had been uh, baptized as a Catholic Armenian. Or the argument, God is one, singing should be in one voice, polyphony is appropriate to polytheism or polyphony is peculiar to the Catholic tradition and against the traditions of the Armenian Orthodox Church. Now soon, Magar Gatorigos was replaced by Megerdich Khrimyan, a much-loved figure known as Khrimyan Hayrig, Daddy Khrimyan, uh, if you wish, and it was hoped that Khrimyan Hayrig would be uh, much more innovative and much more forward-looking, but for one reason or another, possibly personal dislike, it is difficult to say, Khrimyan soon dismissed Karamurza. Uh, in a statement that sounds rather ironic, he is uh, known to have said, you are a very great master, most useful to the nation. The work you have started is good work, but the seminary walls are far too narrow for you. And so, Garamurza was let to go, but very soon afterwards, Gomidas was allowed to conduct four-part harmonizations of bits of the Divine Liturgy with no opposition. Uh, I say no opposition, but there were some uh, monks who apparently this time claimed that Father Gomidas's liturgy reeks not of Catholicism, but of Protestantism. However, we find that a little... A little bit after that, in 1895, Chrimian Hayrig, the Catholicos, sanctioned, authorized the Ekmalian harmonization, and his message, his bull, is printed in the first edition, uh, published by Breitkopf und Hertel in Leipzig in 1896. Similarly, when uh, Amy Apkar uh, in India published what is associated with the New Julfa tradition of Armenian sacred music in harmonization, in harmonized versions again. This time the Catholicos of the day again lent his approval. Again, his message was reproduced uh, at the beginning of one of the volumes. I mentioned that Yekmalian's arguments were not dissimilar to Bianchini's. Uh, referring as they did to our duty to present to God art in its most perfected form, the fulfillment of the art. Moreover, Yekmalian argued that he had kept the traditional melodies, the sacred melodies, invariant. And as he himself had been part of the team that transcribed them into the Limongian notation in the 1870s in Valar Shabbat, he had impeccable credentials in that respect. Chromaticism was purposely and consciously eschewed in his versions, and a Russian commission from the St. Petersburg Conservatoire was pressed into service to provide a testimonial as to its high quality. However, although uh, Yakmalian, as he claimed, for the most part made use of already published melodies 
authorized melodies uh, of the 1870s, here and there we find melodies that are not attested anywhere else. And indeed, my uh, dear friend, the late Krikor Pidejian, once asked me at St. Nerses's Seminary if I knew where the Hairmer that we all sing and love had come from. None of us knows where this melody comes from, and yet we all sing it. Uh, every Armenian child knows it. It is clear that this melody may have been peculiar to the Echmiadzin tradition. Uh, alas, very little of that tradition appears to have reached us. Harmonization, wrote Yekmarian, is not inappropriate or against the spirit of our church, since it, since it is the perfection and fulfillment of music which our ancestors did not eschew, rendering the sacred chants of our church perfect and the most beautiful according to each century and according to the state of development of the art of music. By the way, there were attempts to harmonize Byzantine liturgical chants likewise, and they were performed in Vienna. But uh, this uh, movement was rebuffed, uh, and an ecumenical patriarchal and cyclical uh, of 1846 reads, this sinful innovation is a grave mistake and dangerous and will cause greater transgressions and novelties to be introduced. It grieves our heart. It approaches the customs of the foreigners and the heterodox. Four-part harmony seduces the ears, charms the senses, and enfeebles the soul. For the rest of my talk, I propose uh, to charm your senses, senses perhaps. Uh, I, I, I shall not seek knowingly to enfeeble your souls, of course. I mentioned about the remarkable achievement of Krikor Pidejian, uh, who not only unearthed Karamurza's harmonizations, discovering part books for each individual voice in the Limonjan notation, copied out in 1897, uh, but he also published a fine monograph on Karamurza. And one thing that ought to be emphasized is Karamurza was an exceedingly generous man. Upon hearing the Ekmalian version, he felt that it was a marvelous version, far superior to his own, and he actually propagated that version. He spread it everywhere, he taught it to various choirs, and he instructed his pupils to give precedence to Yekmalian's version uh, to his own. I mentioned Amy Apkar also. I'm most grateful to Professor Sebu Haslanyan and to Liz Chater for this photograph and for the information about her dates of birth and her passing. She, uh, she transcribed the melodies in Calcutta. It's not clear who undertook the harmonizations. Perhaps she undertook them herself, but she acknowledges the assistance of one Dr. Slater, who at the time was organist of St. Paul's Anglican Cathedral in Calcutta. And these melodies are associated with the Armenian traditions of New Julfa in present-day Iran. Now, we understand the first part. This is a specimen of uh, the Amy Apkar missile. Melody and harmonization, rather unusual, but a very similar melody is sung in Constantinople, but with a rather different implied tonal basis. Uh, this harmonization rather meanders harmonically. You get the impression that it's, it's a sort of C minor, although it can't be then G minor or whatever. But in fact, it's a sort of the tonal 
axis is really an F. Um, the melody is very similar to Chorot Chorin. Or This would be a more natural uh, way of looking at this melody. Levon Chilingirian, the grandfather of distinguished London violinist, uh, was also very active. He made two different harmonizations, I believe, of which I've seen only one. The first was published in Zmirna in Dimonjian notation, and I believe that the manuscript that I have, which I received thanks to the kindness of Brother Deacon, uh, Dr. George uh, Leilegian, uh, and a later one published in Jerusalem. Now, he did not have instruction in harmony and in Western music, so it bespeaks of his own musicality, na native musicality, but you find things like consecutive intervals uh, in his harmonizations. And here and there, you do find unusual melodies as well. For example, here there's a version of Christos Imechmerheit Netzav, that I've encountered also in Vienna and in Venice, in a version uh, harmonized by one Italian, Aureliano Ponsilacqua. Christos Imechmerheit Netzav, Voren hast was, hast was Metzav. Uh, rather different to the standard versions that, that we are generally accustomed to hearing. Here you will hear two different versions of the Sanctus. This is the Chilingirian. You can hear the consecutive fifths. Another Yekmalian version. Now, before we hear Gomidas's version, which you can see here, um, I should like to point out that he sometimes made use of unpublished melodies also, as well as treating well-known melodies in a highly original manner. And now, as an initial experiment, I shall try to play um, so that you can hear yourselves compare and contrast essentially more or less the same melody. They are both slightly different from the Var Shabbat transcription that I shall display on the left-hand side, left-hand side, uh, but you will see that they sound rather, completely different. The Yekmalian version first, the Komidas version uh, afterwards. Do please forgive the fact that due to lockdown my piano has not been tuned for a while. Gomitas. completely different harmonization, a more polyphonic treatment as well, but different sense of 
tonal axis. We shall see in a moment how Comidas, brilliant as he was, succeeded in exploiting the modality of Armenian church music in, a, uh, ex in an exceedingly interesting manner. Let's consider Marmin Derunagan, first Karamursa. There is something rather charming about this naive treatment. There's a freshness of approach. Someone, as it were, who has not had formal musical tuition in the Western tradition, discovering and taking pleasure in some simple chords. But let us now hear Yegmalian's version. lovely simple harmonization that one never tires of hearing. I'm very fond of the Ekmalian Badarak. Now Gomidas is a little more adventurous but he has two versions. Let us hear the simpler one first. But now listen to this stunning version where he's playing all sorts of tricks. You can look at it in different ways. You can say he's pretending the tonic is a third uh, the, uh, displaced by a, a third. You can say he's constructing chords not based on triads but on fourths. And uh, he even cleverly uh, modulates and shifts the axis of the whole divine liturgy uh, by a third, as I shall try to demonstrate.
where we ended up and where we started. Uh, he's pretending that this is not a sort of G minor as the previous harmonization, albeit with a sharpened third, uh, but it's a kind of B. Uh, very skillful, stunning. I've found similar things only in Schoenberg's second chamber symphony, the beginning and the end thereof, uh, uh, or for fellow, silly fellow is against me in bedroom Britain's Rejoice in the Lamb, or in Franck Martin's Petite Symphonie Concertante. Um, I think here lies Comitas's genius. Comitas, sadly, published a rather merciless critique of his own former teacher, Ekmal Jan's harmonization. But uh, he did acknowledge that uh, Ekmal Jan uh, had primacy in the harmonizations, in that it was probably the best version that had appeared until then. But his review and critique of Ekmalian's version is particularly valuable as a manifesto about his own ideals. And he says he wishes the stresses of the language and melody to kiss each other. I think this must be an allusion to Psalm 85. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So he wanted a perfect marriage between the melody and the words, and he desired to create a version which, though it, it would be faithful to the traditional Armenian melodies, uh, would constitute a satisfying and unified artistic, artistic, worth, uh, artistic work, a unified artistic work. Kerar vestagan miutun nergahatsunor. Uh, tending towards perfection. Again, we hear about perfection. Now, a brief excursus. Um, I had occasion in recent years to do a lot of work on Antonin Dvorak's Mass in D, which is one of the jewels in the Czech liturgical repertoire, uh, culminating not only in the very recent publication by Baron Reiter of my edition of the piece, uh, but also in substantial investigations of the various sketches made by the composer. Uh, occasionally this helps in producing uh, a good edition and clarifying what the composer wanted, but this happens only occasionally. The main value is that one is able to penetrate the mind of the composer in some sense and see how that mind worked, what the composer's initial thought was, why he perhaps disliked something, crossed it out, modified it, why he retained something else, and decide whether the later ideas were necessarily always better, whether the earlier versions may also warrant hearing, perhaps, not as a replacement for the definitive work, but uh, as an experiment, and Gomidas being, uh, Gomidas's liturgy being perhaps the greatest Armenian work of art music, even though it's not an original composition, the melodies are traditional, but it is such a creative endeavor that it is almost as if it were an original composition. It too warrants this sort of investigation, and this really does have to be done. Now, this is the manuscript on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, the published version. They are the same in this instance. I shall play you a little of my own singing of it with some friends.
but there are instances where the sketches, uh, it almost looks like a Beethoven manuscript, a lot of corrections, almost illegible, and uh, the fair copy here shows what Comidas's more advanced thinking may have been, but there are instances where we've got sketches but no fair copy. And different editors have dealt with this differently, but all this material must become clarified and we need to delve into these things and extract the maximum amount of information, not necessarily to arrive at a critical edition that may be radically different from any other, but to understand how Gomidas's mind worked. That needs to be done. Briefly, I should like to mention some other versions. Uh, as I believe in the course of this festival, colleagues will have cause to uh, uh, mention, there are many different versions of the Mereti chants. These are odes that are performed during the preparation of the gifts. And some of them are known to be fairly recent compositions, 19th century. Uh, certain bits of the divine liturgy, such as Amen Yevantok Vutkum, Amen Harsurp, and ma matching their Vormia settings, are also associated with fairly modern composers, uh, certainly not medieval, uh, people like Aristages Sovanisian, Hamparzum Cercian, and in some instances there are variants that have been explicitly composed uh, to fit in with the uh, constraints of specific Ottoman makams. But we also have complete versions, in some instances including original compositions, such as Archbishop Arsen Aydanian, orchestrated later by Böhm. He had nothing to do with Karl Böhm, I hasten to say. Uh, a very fine musician indeed, and a former pupil of Vincent Dandy at the Schola Cantorum, as well as uh, Archimandrat Comidas, Arab Artevian, uh, and two very fine originally composed versions that are worth cherishing, those by Choren Mechanegian and by George Girazian. Now, there is one particular version that is based on the Gomidas Divine Liturgy, but which is very dear to my heart, and that is a concert suite that was devised by the chamber musician, Zare Sahagyans. This is a work of art made in, uh, created in Soviet Armenia, uh, which I genuinely admire with no reservation. As a concert suite, it works beautifully. It clarifies and amplifies Gomidas's vision. Um, and I'm extremely grateful to the late Aram Gharapegyan, the former principal conductor of the Armenian Chamber Orchestra, who Immediately when I visited him at his office and said, do you happen to have a score of this? I've been looking for it for years. He said, why, yes, of course, it's in this uh, bookcase. Here it is. Run, there's a shop opposite the street. You can have it photocopied. Uh, do perform it. His widow will be delighted. And I have performed it on many occasions since. I had the honor of giving the European uh, premiere. Um, I should like to end my presentation by uh, indicating something about this. He actually moved bits and pieces around. He used only a selection. Uh, in one or two instances, he transposed things. And he also made use of hymns that are not part of the divine liturgy. But it works marvelously as a coherent uh, orchestral symphonic suite. Um, for string orchestra. And I should like to play the last few minutes of it, which embody the Sanctus. This was one of the more recent performances. I had the honor of conducting it with the strings, a small group of strings drawn from the Charles University Orchestra at the Mechitaris Church of St. Mary the Protector in Vienna. Uh, and I should like to play you the concluding poem. I shall take it to just before the sanctus.
These were the strings of my own Mars University Orchestra performing the lovely Warren Orchestra of the Technical Museum of Music in 2016. Why did I call our melodies the melodies of the Armenian Divine Liturgy celestial? Comitas is one who referred to them as celestial pure melodies, but he was not referring to the known melodies of the Armenian Divine Liturgy. In a letter in which he was seeking Catholicos Matthäus Ismirian's assistance to obtain a manuscript from a reluctant bishop, uh, a manuscript that Comidas was convinced would help him decipher the medieval news, he says that he wishes to decipher those neumes in order to reconstruct the original melodies as he saw them, those elusive uh, melodies, casting aside the veil obscuring our most ancient and authentic liturgical music, revealing the original celestial pure melodies. But for Bianchini, the melodies to which he was exposed himself as he listened to the monks in San Nazaro singing, these already were celestial. And in the instructions, this is a little slip of paper I found in one of his manuscripts at the San Nazaro archives. He urges his singers, because he used evidently Italian singers for some performances, uh, he urges them to use the right sort of rhythmic flexibility within the rules of the art, and that if this music is performed as it ought to be, then those chants have the power, uh, th th then uh, this manner of performing has the power to render the chants sublime, celestial, and at once most pleasing to our hearts and to our ears. I should like to thank all those organizations and individuals for their most generous assistance enabling me to carry out this research. Um, to the Armenian Institute that invited me uh, last year to give what is a precursor to the present lecture. The present lecture advances my thinking, my thinking in the light of further reflection and more documentary evidence that I have been able to uh, obtain and analyze, and not least Father Hovhan Khoja Enatian and His Grace Bishop Daniel van der Kian for this kind invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, before we say goodbye for this evening, let us remember it has taken us 1,000 years, if not more, to get where we are. So do let us value and enjoy and cherish the music of the Armenian Divine Liturgy. There is one further thing I should like to mention. I discovered yesterday that uh, the bishop wished to give me a very generous fee for the present modest uh, uh, lecture demonstration, having enjoyed very generous hospitality from Father Daniel at St. Nurses, I could not possibly accept a fee. So I decided that there might be a good solution. I have decided to support, and I should like to ask the organizers not to send the fee to me, but to send it to this charity. There is an Armenian Czech charity called Give Me Hope in Prague. It's an organization run by two Armenian hairdressers and their Czech colleagues who started raising funds by, uh, this sounds very mundane, but undertaking uh, carrying out haircuts, telling their customers that the customer may decide what he or she will pay, but if they make a donation to help young Armenian soldiers, they will be very grateful. They manage to raise substantial amounts. Their aim has been to help young Armenian soldiers, particularly those who lost a limb in the recent Artsakh war, to get artificial limbs. Uh, there is high quality treatment at modest prices in the Czech Republic that has a very fine tradition in those things, and um, physiotherapy and treatment is being carried out in the Czech Republic. Members of the Armenian community in the Czech Republic are involved, as is the Armenian Church, 
including Archimandrite, the very reverend Parcel in Prague, and the Catholic legate for Central Europe, Diran Serpazan in Vienna. Uh, three young soldiers, Aram Sarkis and Norair, are now able to walk and to walk well. Their fourth colleague, who most recently arrived in Prague, it was found that be before he could be endowed with artificial limbs, he requires an operation, and that operation is happening now as we speak in Vienna. And this charity is determined to continue its work, also supporting other wounded soldiers who may require other forms of medical or surgical treatment available in the Czech Republic, but not readily available in Armenia. These are some recent images. They are being assisted by specialized uh, personnel at a Czech hospital. Um, if you wish to find out more about this, this was covered in the press, both in the Armenian European, Pan-European Orer magazine, but also in the Czech magazine Respect. These are images from recent articles uh, about the achievements of those uh, ladies and of the soldiers whom they have been helping. So should you wish similarly to assist, you have already assisted them by registering for this festival, because as I said, my own fee will be transferred in support of this charity. But should any of you wish further to assist, here are particulars. You can contact the main organizer, the account numbers, uh, relevant details are here, and I shall pass these on to Father Hovnan. So should anyone wish uh, to offer some support and assistance to this uh, important work, I shall be all the more pleased. So thank you very much indeed for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes my presentation.